Brother Terry Hightower has been with us on several sure. lecture ships. He's a faithful gospel and president in Nevada, Texas, since August of 2004. He says since last year they've had one daughter, Madeline Hightower, I think they're calling her Maddie, to the grandson. She's a year old this month, February. And he said uh, that he recently he won an award as an A-plus special education assistant in Amarillo, his elementary school. He says that's where he does his tent making so he can preach. Well, that's what we may all have to do for so will. That's all right. Wasn't too good for Paul. <laughs> too bad for him either. In fact, it served very well. We appreciate Terry taking time out. That's one reason he's in such a schedule that he's got to leave just as soon as we're through here to be able to catch the airplane about 925 back out to uh, Ella. And we're glad that he can be with us. We appreciate him for his work's sake. He's speaking to us with feigned words. They will make merchandise of you. Come speak to us, Brother Terry. Okay, turn that machine on. I would appreciate it for that overhead. <coughs> We're going to start out, instead of with the Bible, we're going to start out with the last book of uh, nature, which is God's second book, which, of course, everyone in the world has the book of nature, whether they have the written special revelation of the Word of God. They have things like this. The Bible, repeat, will teach lessons from uh, creatures. Of course, know and can count on those, but many of them we can just run to ourselves. The Bible says, go to the ant. A sluggard, so if you're a sluggard tonight, it's kind of that verse would be kind of uh, hitting you rather strong. But I'm going to use this one and sort of summarize. I want you to listen very carefully as I describe the Porsche spider to you. This happens to be a male. I think females, I believe, are about as bad as the male. So you ladies perk up and listen. You just have to pretend there's a female up here also. But the Porsche spider, uh, the spider is a master predator whose chief weapon is deception. To begin with, the spider looks like a piece of dried leaf or foliage blown into the web of another spider. When it attacks other species of spiders, it uses a variety of methods to lure the host spider into striking range. Sometimes it crawls onto a, the web and taps the threads in a manner that mimics the vibrations of a mosquito caught in the web. It mimics the vibrations of a mosquito caught in this other spider. The host spider then marches out for dinner, he thinks, and that becomes the dinner himself. The Porsche spider can actually tailor its deception for its prey, we're told, by the experts who study them with a type of uh, spider that maintains its home inside a rolled up leaf, the Porsche dances on the outside of the leaf that that spider is rolled up in, emitting mating rule. Porsche can find a signal, we're told, by for just about any spider by trial and error. Trial and error till it finds what works. It makes different signals until the, uh, the victim finally responds appropriately and then keeps making the signal. When he gets a response, he just keeps it up. In fact, I read in one book uh, that the, the Porsche spider uh, can work at that. He will for three days. He is that persistent, if necessary, to get that to come out where he can get a hold of him, kill him, and eat him. Lull their victims into a false sense of security. Do it primarily by deception. And the writer, we all know, and you've heard verses after verse, and many of it's in mind also, concerning Satan's choice, weapon of choice. And folks, it's deception. Satan's weapon of choice is deception. Dave, you can put the next one up if you would. Over and over again in, in Scripture, we see that man can be hoodwinked. And we're going to use a certain verse uh, tonight, and that 
This from 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 3. So I want, for lack of time, I know I'm going to run out of time as I usually do. Uh, but notice, in reference to fellowship, and this does apply to fellowship, certainly, uh, that Peter says, as explicitly, we can learn it from the Porsche spider, from the butcher, but we're not up to just that. We've got God's explicit word on it telling us specifically what we ought to uh, be aware of and recognize the danger of. Because Peter says, and in covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. Now, when you, I wish I had time to go through the total context. We'll come back and deal with that uh, more in a minute. But what we're saying in all this is that it is true that Christians, we are here in green, Christians are to be innocent and guileless and non or unworldly, but we are not to be, brethren, naive. And Peter is telling you, don't be gullible, do not be a naive, gullible Christian. Now, uh, the Bible says in Proverbs 14, 15, the believeth every word. But the prudent man looketh all to his going. Same principle that Peter is laying out for us here. In fact, Paul repeatedly warns that there are many unruly men, vain talkers and deceivers, uh, whose mouths must be stopped, men who overthrow whole houses, or let's just add it in, who overthrow uh, whole colleges or whole schools of or public houses, brethren, or even whole congregations of God's people, elders included. And they're teaching things they ought not, and he ascribes this purpose to the ones he's speaking of anyway, for filthy lucre's sake. That's Titus 1, verses 10 and 11. Now you may have a little understanding of what we're saying here, and that Peter is, and the other verses, many others will not be able to deal with, of course, tonight. But just even this one alone in Proverbs 14, 15 and Titus 1, 10 and 11 prove for all time that Christians are not to be gullible, naive types of persons. Jesus was not. I have a section in there uh, doubt I'll get to. But just in the Son of God in one instance about him. And was he uh, an innocent person? Certainly he was compared to us because we sinned. Was he guileless? There was no guile found, of course, uh, at all. He's our perfect example. Uh, he, he was one who was non-worldly, certainly in another sense different than us, and that he came from a different place and came to this earth, whereas, of course, we, we were born here. Of course, our spirits came from God, so we're in that sense, I guess, unworldly. But he was not worldly in the sense that uh, while he taught sinners, uh, while he would eat with publicans and sinners, the scripture teaches, he did not, of course, fellowship them in their evil deeds or anything like that. And yes, we're to be all three of those things as I've listed them, but we are not, I'm stressing, to be naive. Now, let me explain here what we're talking about when we refer to uh, what naivety is all about. And as much as I hate to use an individual in the audience, I'm waiting. So you really were shocked I said that. Okay, uh, but Lester and Lillian Camp, and I hate to use them, but I've picked on so many other people, I guess I better spread it around a little bit. Uh, but Lillian and, and Lester met, and Lillian informed me one time on the phone about how naive he was when they first met, you know, in reference especially, she said, to romance and stuff like that. And she said that he up, Terry, he says, this is no lie, he made up. She said, I'm telling you, Lester stayed up night studying for our blood test before we got married. <laughs> and she said, I said, he was that bad. She said, back before when he was first going to ask me out, she said that he came to her and he, he said, uh, Lillian, uh, he said, if you can guess, he held his hands out like, said, if you can guess what I have in my hands, I'll take you out Friday night. And she said, an elephant, you'll get it in a minute. He, he, Lester, was, Lester was quick. He said, close enough. I'll see you at 7 o'clock Friday night. And she said, and I'll end with this one because there's so many we could call it all night. But she said that Lester was so naive that as far as romance goes, first started dating, you know, she said that Lester thought pitching Wu was a Chinese transfer student. Well, you know, obviously he's in need of more help than most of us could give him. 
I'm glad his son is here tonight with us to hear some of this. He needs to kind of be aware of some of these things. But brethren, we can not only learn from the poor writer about these matters from God's book of nature, what, uh, what is said in the word of God about being uh, non-gullible. In other words, being conscious or aware, basically, of what we're doing. But Christians are to be people. That's why we try to stress logic in this relationship. Christians, uh, there, there are Christians around, as you're hearing about during especially this lectureship uh, this year, there are Christians who will fool the members, other members of Christ's church at the expense of those members. That's what Peter's saying here. And in covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. And I want you to notice that. Uh, Williams translates this. In their greed they will exploit you with messes measured by cells. There it is. They will exploit you. Uh, then you think it's an accident? The Apostle Peter explicitly states this in 2 Peter 2 uh, and verse 3. It never ceases to amaze me to run into brethren who don't, uh, if they're aware of this verse, they're certainly not aware of it since their practice of the feet on the ground, the rubber meets road type of practical situation that they find themselves themselves in. And, he, and Peter here, though, is saying and explicitly reforming us as his Christian readers that there is more involved than just uh, always being an instructor of truth. I've been told that several times. Uh, and one brother who, and I tell about it in the in case I don't get to it, uh, who went and spoke at ASU a few years back. In fact, it was the second time he went. And some of us contacted him. And he calls me up, irate, and starts jumping on me and working me over about that. And I just said, well, uh, Brother So-and-so, just please answer this verse that I ask you about. Uh, and that if you, he said, I'm going to be teaching the truth, Terry, nothing but the truth, 100% truth. I said, I have no doubt about that, Brother So-and-so. No one accused you, including me, of that. I said, but are you aware that one could be using you by the ACU school? Oh, they had lots of other solid, sound brethren on that lectureship, don't you imagine? No, he's the only one. I said, why did you think they picked you out? I said, answer the verse I've asked you about. Don't dream up other stuff. Explain this to me and your behavior and what you did. And in fact, it proved out just exactly as I said. He said, I'm going to be teaching the truth. I said, yeah, and some people will just come because you're there, but what if those students there... Will, that, will they take it that this university is all, oh, that this university is turning over a new, that they're going to change things and get the Bible to what it should be, the other departments and place for the evolution and everything else? Well, you know, he has no answer for that. He didn't really look at this verse, I don't believe, and see himself, and that he was really going against the principle here of Peter. Uh, and he's, he's that spider over there rolled up and, hearing those taps, and for certain, I would say, ego things, where we can be padded and strong enough, brethren, where we think, oh, boy, they, they want me to come over here and speak at this big lectureship. I've never been over there before. I'll go over there. Well, there's brethren who will even pay you to come over to do that for them if they can manipulate and exploit and they can use you in certain situations to their own uh, nefarious ends. And that's exactly what I believe that brother and some others have done, some even recently, maybe in connection, brethren, to century 21, uh, 20, 21st century uh, Christian, we'd say, not the real estate group, <laughs> but the, the, the publishing house, and say, well, you come and you'll get to speak on instrumental music, brother so-and-so, uh, but could you, should you not at least think it through and use this verse as a sieve and say, could they be using and manipulating me? And I believe that was the case in that situation myself, and I don't believe I would have gone. But, again, the fact is we need to see what Scripture says, that Peter straightforwardly sets forth this principle here that many good and unwary brethren fail to heed uh, with regard to the masters of such hand and misdirection in their exploitation of their fellow believers. The word fame comes from the Greek uh, adjective Plastos, and it's used only here in the New Testament. It, it first meant formed or molded, 
and it can be compared with our own term plastic. Is a practical way to look at it. It came to mean fabricated, feigned, or made up. And therefore, the idea of the words uh, of the molded at will, or words molded at will to suit the situation so they can practice their immoral utilitarianism by doing evil that good may come, uh, and so for their own ulterior and purposes, whatever they are. Romans 3 and verse 8, of course, falsifies uh, doing evil that good may come. Um, doesn't it? it enlightens those of us, and some of you sitting here, some of you listening, uh, uh, and where this will be going is broadcast to. Uh, he enlightens those who might have a tendency to what I would call naivety. Uh, Note that you're naive to the methodology of false teaching. Peter matter-of-factly informs us in this verse that folks will merchandise. Look at it; they will merchandise uh, their brothers in Christ who ignorantly afford them such acts as notori their own personal notoriety in the brotherhood, or reputation in other words, they're standing among brethren, they want that, they're going to, they may use it and manipulate it, you see, to their own ends. It may have special topic that you've studied, brother or sister, or preacher, uh, at least you brothers at least, uh, a certain topical thing, or you, maybe some ladies class or some ladies situation they want you to speak at some expertise you have with children. I don't know. It could be any of that. Or perhaps just simply somebody's academic or some leadership position. It may even involving clout in a geographical area in which they're using you. Uh, and they need you for themselves. We surely have, don't we, brethren, a lot of plasticized preachers around today as recent events have been proven. They, they mold it and fit it, you see. And we've heard some today uh, speak concerning this. The fact is, Peter warns us that it's possible that some people might even ask you to sign a statement of support so that they could, may attempt to convince uh, supporters uh, to conclude nothing could be wrong. Nothing could be wrong over there. After all, look at all these red names on this uh, statement of, of support. Uh, Peter says that it's possible that they even concoct an invented explanation put quotes around explanation, full of unsound arguments that sound good, especially to trusting Christians who do not wish to be regarded as suspicious of their fellow believers. I remember hearing Chuck Lucas use 1 Timothy 4 and talk about brethren, about them at Crossroads, who were having, uh, they were having these uh, evil surmisings. He said it about like that. Evil surmisings against them at Crossroads. Well, it wasn't evil surmisings. It was fact. It wasn't evil surmisings at all. And he attempted then, you remember, brethren, he leaned on name, so-called name brethren. I'll tell you one. Juan Zo Welch was one of them, and there's a whole bunch of others who either supported Crossroads in their movement or they could not find or see anything wrong with them. Uh, think of the heartache, brethren, and the eternal damage those foolish brethren helped to cause, even if they had what to them were good motives in what they were doing. Look at the damage that they've done, and that's exactly what's ha happening uh, right now. Well, we should, we should note the phrase there, make merchandise of, comes from a, a Greek verb that's used here and only in James 4.13. And it first meant to travel, especially for business, in James 4.13, is it to speak of those shrewd but worldly businessmen who say, today we're going to go into this city and spend a year and aid and get gain. And let the Marshall's Interlinear says, make a profit. And that's what it's saying here, making merchandise, you see, of a person. That's exactly what it's saying here, like it's used in James 4.13. Peter uses it here to make to mean make a gain of, or America's standard says, like, and although it's usually involved, please do not assume this type of mentality views money, as I've already pointed out, as the only type of profit they desire to make. They may even pay you, as I said, for coming their way uh, if, if such is supportive enough of their premeditated plan or scheme, which they dare not accordingly and honestly declare to you, because then go, you see. Uh, and though we would prefer in Christian charity not to face such, Peter emphatically declares that some members of the Lord's church will use your 
name, your name, and your circle of influence and good reputation, as I said, for their own nefarious purposes, as they would buy and sell and trade livestock. That's just the fact of it, and we must face that uh, issue. And again, it never ceases to make me wonder about this. Christians are not to be ignoramus dupes. We are to have some intelligence about what we do. And while we love people and we don't want to read too much and try to think we're God and read motives all the time, you better look Peter at their system. Put the other one up if you would, Dave. Let's, let's just take a little test here. Turn back to, uh, to Kings, Second Kings, uh, with me. For Second Kings, chapter five. You remember what happened in verse eleven? Naaman became furious and went away. You a mature? Or you an immature uh, brother or sister in Christ? Let's see if we can find out. Uh, and Naaman went away and said, "Indeed, I said to him, he'll surely come out and wave his hand over it and all that." He had it his own way. We put on this over and over again, shown the truth of it. Look on to verse 15, though. You remember once he dipped in the river, he dipped in the Jordan seven times, and his skin was restored like the flesh of a little child. Verse 14 says and he was clean. And he returned to the man of God, he and all his age, and came, verse 15, and stood before him, and he said, Indeed, now I know that there is no God in all, all the earth except in Israel. Now that please take a gift from your servant. And what was the answer in verse 16? But he as the this is Elisha, as the Lord before whom I stand, I will receive nothing. And he urged him to take it. Naaman did. He refused to take it. Now, go over our verses to verse 20. But Gehazi, the servant of the last of the man of God, said, Look, my master spared Naaman the Syrian while not receiving from his hands what he brought. But as the Lord lives, I will run after him and take something from him. But he has to concoct the plan, brethren. He has to think of something to say because we're reversing the situation, aren't we? Because Elisha said, I won't take it. I won't take it. He refused it. So he has to give a justification for it, and he does with feigned words. Watch what he says. So Gehazi, for 7, 21, when Naaman saw him running after him, he got down from the chariot to meet him and said, is all well? He's just a neophyte, brethren. He's not, he doesn't know a lot of things yet. That's evidence by a lot of things in this text. But he says in verse 22, uh, Gehazi says, all is well. My master has sent me. Had he? No. It's a bald-faced lie, but he's going to justify it with feigned words and make merchandise of this man if he can. And he says, Indeed, now two young men of the sons of the prophets have come to me from the mountains of Ephraim. Please give them, he's saying, putting words in Elisha's mouth, please give them a talent of silver and two changes of garments. Now should Naaman have believed so Naaman said, please take, take two talents, not just one talent of silver, but two. And he urged him, he's a generous man, he's just gotten rid of his leprosy. He's responding out of that uh, young convert uh, situation, isn't he? And, and two talents of silver and two eggs two changes of garment and handed them to two of his servants and they carried them on ahead of him. Oh, I, now we know Gehazi gets it anyway because God knows what we do anyway. But would to God that Naaman had said, and I studied this and got to thinking about it, and he had said, I'll tell you what, you know, you kind of kind of black on what Elisha, your master, told me. How about if I send one of my men over there back into town and they ask Elisha about this? <laughs> what would have happened? <laughs> that would have kind of flushed it out, wouldn't it? Be uh, I, I, like I said here, uh, you got, you can, I can perhaps understand, and you can too, a spiritual neophyte like Naaman falling for Gehazi's cleverly concocted feigned words whereby he says this in verse 22 to him, and he believes him. Uh, but what I could, would and could not understand would be for veteran spokesman for God swallowing the total reverse imposition by Elisha, even cunningly set for the greedy and exploitive Gehazi. And so in view of Bible teaching, in regards to all of false teachers and their deception and their possible use of exploiting you with manufactured words or however you want to word it from 2 Peter 2 verse 3, can you check the box and say, I'm a mature Christian. I realize, Terry, what you're saying, what Peter said in 2 Peter 2 3. I'm an immature Christian. I'm a mature Christian. Which one? I hope when you leave tonight, if you don't get anything else out of this lesson, get this of 2 Peter 2, 
in verse 3. I didn't write it, but you didn't write it, but we're all under that principle, and we ought to use it, brethren. Uh, we do it every day with some people, especially those kids in our house, especially if they're teenagers sometimes. I don't believe everything. When my, teenage, when my children were teenagers, that they would tell me about a thing. Oh, I wanted to. But when the facts are going against them and going a different way, I'm still investigating and checking it out. Isn't that what this verse is implying? Surely uh, it is. Well, go to the next one, Dave, if you would. <clears throat> Now, with feigned words of merchandise, you in corroboration support of Dave Miller's false doctrine in, as regarding in, in, regard, in regard to marriage, divorce, remarriage, and in defense of the sordid case of Everett Chambers, Maxie Bourne actually says, have you seen this? Uh, it's on the Internet. You can listen to the tape. I think it's on the tape uh, that uh, Michael Hatcher has of the CD. If you don't intend to marry, he's summarizing coming off what Dave Miller had said, he said, if you don't intend to marry someone as a lifelong companion and you've gone through the ritual for some, in some invalid reason, I think that would negate the idea of what marriage is all about. Now, well, wait a minute. Uh, good brethren, practically every marriage, every marriage would then have, thereby have this out since any ignorance or lack of intent of, of all of God's biblical purposes. Just taking what he said here, uh, all of God's biblical purposes or intentions and that he purposes and intentions and so forth involving marriage would negate then his joining the couple together, which is what he's trying to show about the Everett Chambers uh, case. Uh, but think about what's being said here. Uh, uh, Surely all you women, you can pull it on nowadays, surely all you women who married these gospel preachers sitting in lecture audiences like this one at spring, right now tonight, did not marry these guys next to you as lifelong companions. Or at least I have trouble believing that. Looking at, looking at some of them, like Lillian for sure, I can't imagine that you meant to marry Lester Lillian for two years. And looking at some of you, maybe some of you less than that of what you purpose. So, you, but you see the implication of what he's saying really is. You listen to this whole text; it is so foolish as to be incredible. And I want you to be sure and leave my Vicky, of course, out of this. I'm talking about all you guys, not about myself. <laughs> Seriously, hear the tape for yourself and check this out. Don't depend on someone else. It's as close as the internet. Someone. I'll even help you if you don't know how to get on the internet or listen to the CD. You can find out about these situations. Why in the world there's not at least one of those 60 men who signed that statement of support about Dave Miller? Many of you know me writing him, and I've known him all seven years at the Shenandoah Electors. And no ill will here, but I know where when I see it, so can you. And it doesn't who it is, it's the what, not the who. It's the what, not the who. It has to be that way, or otherwise you fall into what Brother Watson dealt with also today. You see respect or person, don't you? Cannot do it. Cannot do it. When some of us folks as parents are not doing our kids any favor either when they're apostate and unfaithful, uh, when we go ahead and just act like everything's okay, and when it's not. That goes ties in, doesn't it, maybe, uh, with the lesson concerning church discipline that we heard the other night and so forth. It's an act of love to do what uh, God said. Well, again, this is me of an aunt I had. Better than some of us have, be, are, have become enablers to these people because we violate the principle that's taught in 2 Peter 2 and verse 3. We become enablers to them. I had an aunt who, who was married to a, a booze hound writer and she was the wife. And she would call relatives who finally got fed up to hear with it because she would always repeatedly go back. She would not get the police to do anything about it, wouldn't press charges, or they might dry him out for a night or two. But then he's right back. She t would take him right back over and over again, abusing the children, abusing her, uh, ruining her financially, having to bear the load. Finally, some of my uncles and others just told her, don't call me anymore, even though they were, they were a sister, a brother-sister situation with her. 
because she became and was an enabler to the evils of this man to whom he was married. And that's exactly my view about what some brethren are, are doing. We become enablers with people when we violate uh, Peter 2 verse 3, not looking and saying, is this person possibly with feigned words uh, of faking me out here? As we go back to the situation concerning Gehazi and Naaman, you notice what happened there? Notice specifically that Gehazi used Naaman's own goodness to his own advantage, Gehazi's advantage, in order to exploit or to manipulate Naaman. Isn't that right? She used his own goodness to do it. And that's exactly what brother are doing today in, in doing similar and feigned words being merchandise of brothers and sisters in Christ. Well, uh, did you also notice uh, that to explain the apparent change of heart on the part of Elisha, supposed, the concocted change of heart on the part of Elisha, that Gehazi concocts a, a slick story, uh, sort of like this. Well, the situation has changed. Go back and look at that real quick. Isn't that what he's saying? The situation has changed. He's got to explain it some way. Well, brethren, we have the right to say, I, I want to check this out a little bit further. You elders know that. You don't just take and I hope you accept any situation that comes along. Uh, someone come and ask for money. Okay, let's get the money. Write them a check. Don't check it out. Don't ask any questions. Don't see where these people are really and what they truly hold uh, and require certain recommendations from people whom you do know and trust. The Bible repeatedly, and we put verses in this material for you that I hope that you'll read, uh, that, that over and over again warn us of the deceptive method of false teachers. Uh, because the fact is, God can frustrate us. This is Job 5.12. God can certainly frustrate us, the devices, Scripture says, of the crafty, so that their hands cannot perform their enterprise. But brethren, he cannot do it. When Christians, naive, gullible Christians, ignore the fact that the Lord's people can form an assembly, Scripture says in Jeremiah 9, of, a tre of treacherous men, and they bend their tongue uh, uh, as it as it their bow for falsehood. He said, Take heed, Jeremiah did, Jeremiah 9, verses 2 through 6, Take ye heed every one of his neighbor, and trust ye not in any brother. You better not, 100%. You better not even trust half her husband 100% with your soul. Isn't that right? You know that's correct. For, uh, for every brother will utterly supplant, and every neighbor will go about with slanders, and they will deceive everyone who does not speak the truth. They have taught their tongues to speak lies, and so, and so on. Well, again, over and over again, this is not a matter either, brethren, of just simply have it being cranky, overly suspicious cynics, see a false brother behind every bush. But it is simply a matter of facing reality and heeding the word of the Lord in healthy and cautious skepticism which frustrate the uh, machinations or the thinking and the methods of foxy people. Whether they're in or out of the church, it'll stop it. If we will back off for a minute and think about what we're doing and think of Second Peter, the principle chapter 2, verse 3, or if you don't think of anything else, maybe I've given you a nightmare tonight about a Porsche spider. If that's what it takes to get it across to you to think about what you're doing and not let brethren manipulate and use you. Isn't it a fact, brethren, that those 61 people who signed that statement of purpose for Mahal J Express were manipulated by either Brother Miller and or others, I don't know, but they were exploited. They really were, as we're hearing during this lectureship. And we should not do that. This is the approach, in fact, of Christ. It says, if you're scripture, and look at it in Luke 20. We're going to find uh, Luke 20, beginning at verse 20. It says, and they watched him and sit for spies. Watch this about Jesus now. Uh, the, the approach is alive and well, just like it was back then, who seen themselves to be righteous that they might take hold of his feet so as to deliver him up to the rule and the, to the authority of the God. They asked him, saying, Teach we know that thou sayest and teachest rightly, and acceptest not the person of it. truth, teachest the ways, the way of God, and it is lawful, it lawful for us to give tribute unto Caesar or not. But he perceived on it, put it in bold, highlight it, but he perceived their craftiness, 
and said unto them, you remember what he did? He got the coin and then said, render unto Caesar's things unto Caesar's. He passed through the horns of the so-called dilemma they, they thought he had him in. And he said, uh, render the, uh, unto Caesar the things of God, the things that are God's, using a coin right from them which hung them in about it. They used Caesar's money. And they were not able to take hold of the saying before the people. And they marveled at his answer and held their peace. Thus what we're saying is our loving Lord Jesus Christ was not an easy mark, but he was rather an astute realist who refused to be hoaxed by these people. He refused to be hoodwinked or hornswoggled by cunning human foxes. Didn't he call someone that one? Tell Herod that what? Fox. He knew what 2 Peter 2 verse 3 says, and he knew how to apply it, and he did it. He lived it. And we must do that exact same thing. I put some material in there by that cunning and artful dodger and self-style change agent, Lynn Anderson. And I want you to read that. I hope we'll read this uh, the whole chapter in the way uh, that we presented it and uh, instead of the way perhaps that we're trying to uh, hit the highlights tonight. The late B Let me close with this. The late B.C. Carr was adept in using the offer of Nehemiah, as you remember, to, dem to demonstrate that participation with errors under certain conditions was to involve oneself in compromise. That's what we're talking about. You will remember that Nehemiah's opposers proposed a unity meeting saying and saying, come, let us meet together in one of the villages in the plain of Ono. That's Nehemiah 6, verse 2. What was Nehemiah's response, brethren? Oh, no. That was his response, was it? as we should also be able to do that today. And he explained his lack of fellowship with them. He said, but they thought to do me mischief. That's what Peter's telling us in 2 Peter 2, verse 11. And over and over again in the Bible and many other verses. Uh, they thought to do me mischief. He knew what, what, in reality what was happening. Uh, just like Jesus did with Jews a moment ago uh, from that passage. And, say, and I sent messengers unto them saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the works whilst I leave it and come down to you? And they sent unto me four times. They're persistent, just like that Porsche spider. Uh, and they sent unto me four times after this sort, and I answered them after the same manner. Je Nehemiah 6, verses 2 through 4. What was that manner again? Come down to the plains of Ono. And he says, oh no. <laughs> oh no. Oh no. Guys, you're going to do me mischief. I'm not fellowshipping you. I'll let you use me and get me off track here. Most false brethren back then were relentless in Nehemiah's day uh, in their pursuit of compromise, even to the point of false charges and an offer to work together to solve the problem. But taking a page from Peter cannot do it. Peter says, be sober, be watchful. Your adversary of the devil is a run walking about seeking whom he may devour, whom withstand in your faith. I hope that you'll do that tonight. Watch out, fighters. Well, that was a stem winder. That was a good one. We appreciate it. Uh, something that I think we've noticed for a long time regarding the important point he made on being naive. Just plainly don't see the forest for the trees. They just don't. We can't allow ourselves to do that and confuse that with love and mercy and tender kindness and all that kind of thing. We've just got to realize that the facts won't allow that to happen. We'll stay with the facts. So we thank him so very much. We have about uh, seven or eight minutes before top hour. Terry has to leave immediately, so don't try to hold him up. We'll get stuck down here with us too long. He's got to be out at the airport. And, and so we will stand dismissed.